Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Chris Rydell, actor and now podcast host, I guess. Um, that guy you've seen on a million TV shows and movies, but you still do not know my name. And I'm David Allen Bache, actor and sometimes producer. And you also recognize me from lots of films and TV shows, but you probably couldn't name one of them right now if I paid you to. The two of us and our guests are going to let you in on some secrets on how to make it as an actor and share some private stories from the many movies and TV shows that we've worked on. That's right. We're going to interview a special guest each week, and we'll get their best advice and wisdom for you about how to break into this business and how to stay in it. And yes, again, there will be stories, stories, stories. So let's get to it. This is Confessions of a Working Actor. Recording is on. We are officially on the air. Well, I want to thank you for giving me so much time to think about what I was going to talk about. Yes, I gave you at least 30 seconds when I said, Chris, you start. Well prepared. <laughs> I went to the mailbox today. Um, oh, that's to, no good story it has ever started re- that way. To receive a, a check from my agent oh. from this commercial, and it was $62.50. Hey, well, you're buying lunch. I was not happy about that. <laughs> Listen, I've gotten I've gotten checks that are worth less than the stamp it takes to mail them to the bank to deposit oh, no. them. But but this isn't what I was expecting. Oh. When I know those checks, those those are yeah. coming from the Screen Actors Guild. Yeah, I like to but post when, the ones coming seven. from my agency. Yeah, I'm expecting a little bit more than sixty two fifty, but I'll be grateful. Hey, listen, you know, beats working for a living. It sure does. Um, <laughs> so talk to me about this week's guest. Ah, well, all right. So we're going to do a little something different this week for our listeners. And I know the show is called Confessions of a Working Actor. But lots of other people who deal with actors in the entertainment business. So today we're going to talk to, wait for it, a writer-producer. I did a little research, actually. Yeah. We're really mixing yeah. it up here. That's right. We yeah. are. We yeah. are. This week's guest has been um, a producer, staff writer, co-executive producer on some pretty heavy shows. Yeah. Yeah. Co-EP. Um, that's a big, uh, that's basically the right-hand man, um, if not the person that's really doing the show running while the other person is out gallivanting. And with all that experience with actors, you know, I think he's generated a lot of wisdom, and I think our listeners are going to want to hear it. Well, then let's not waste any time. Yeah. Let's introduce the very talented, Emmy nominated, as I saw. Yep. Ted Sullivan. Hi, guys. Welcome, Welcome Hi. Ted. Welcome. Welcome uh, to the podcast. They're, the only thing I hate more than talking about myself is, is hearing my own voice. So uh, that's this is great. This is a double whammy. This is a double whammy. This is going to be great. Uh, that's one. You're not even an actor, and and that bothers you. That's interesting. I know lots of no. actors that won't watch their own work or listen to their own voice. That's very interesting. Well, listen. Pretend you don't hear yourself. We'll make it quick and painless. The hour uh, will go by very <laughs> fast. Um, now, full disclosure: Ted and I met um, quite a while ago on a film called "I'll Believe You," and that's how we met. And um, Ted, can you sort of set up for our listeners? what that film was and and what your part in it was i i played a a, a role in the film uh, as an actor but tell us about that well you played more than a role uh you were the lead uh we uh it was a brainchild of my brother who at the time was a stand-up comedian and he was a videographer and wanted to do his first feature film and so he, he also had been doing um uh, a talk radio show with a friend of his, uh, a great comedian who also appears in the movie, uh, Richie Duncan. Um, and they would do a late night talk show and they wondered, was anyone listening to it? And it was a movie ba- that grew out of that thinking, well, what happens if an alien calls into this late night oh. talk show? Uh, and before, no one believes him. Before you said alien, I was thinking it's a lot like this podcast. It's like, is any, we're, we're just, Chris, <laughs> Chris and I are talking. Is anybody we're listening? Is anybody listening? Is anybody listening? That's right. Please go on. Please go. On. I think I think it's probably a common uh, thought for anyone in front of a microphone in a yeah. in a in a booth. Yes, um, and so he uh, at that point I had been a writer for soap opera uh, for a bunch of years. 
I had stepped away and was living in San Francisco and my brother asked me to help on the project. So uh, uh, a buddy of mine, Sean McFarlane and I did some passes at the script. Uh, and But mainly I was the producer on that. Uh, it was my brother's movie. He was the director, he was the writer. And, and I was the one who got both the money and raised it in Silicon Valley primarily uh, by making presentations to venture capitalist groups back at a time when it was uh, at this wow. point where they were all looking, what can we invest in? And so I convinced a bunch of people to put some money in. Uh, and then we went about casting uh, with a good friend of ours, Laura Corrin. Uh, she found David uh, and also our entire cast. It had really great people. It had Ed Helms and Mo Rocca and Patrick Warburton and Siobhan Fallon and uh, Chris Elliott um fred willard so it was just a great mix of fun people uh and a nice sweet little movie uh, it was very very hard to make uh i didn't know what i was doing mm, join the club. Uh, yeah right yeah. and uh we made mistakes literally every day uh i think it, it it's a it's a sweet movie i learn i i always tell people i learn more from failure than i do from success and so that movie taught me a lot because i made a lot of mistakes a lot mm -hmm. of mistakes mm -hmm. um but I, I i also learned how to be an editor I, I i really worked on the editing with that with two other editors and taught myself that skill set which actually served me quite well as i was trying to break back into writing later i, I had it i had another kind of career that I could fall back on. So prior to this, you had just been writing on on a daytime show. Which That's by correct. the way, by the way, my father was on that show for six talking, or seven years. We're talking about as the world turns? Yeah. Uh -huh. My father was on that show when it was live in the 50s. Ooh. Yeah, people don't realize that it was live. It, it was live all the way up until I think the mid 80s, you know, or the early 80s. It's unbelievable. Uh, yeah. And we Imagine. did, we had five to six writers in a room. We wrote about six to seven episodes a week so that we would have a wow. little bit of a buffer. Um, so sometimes you wrote two episodes a week. It was really uh, quite a training course we've said yeah. that it's interesting we've said that about actors right chris we've talked to a few people a few guests who've talked about the what great training soap operas were as an actor you have to memorize all the lines very quickly you have to develop a character very quickly so it's interesting to hear that from a writer as well you, we as actors don't think about that but of course the writers also are are you know really banging it out really yeah i was uh, about to say you know you know memorizing dialogue for you know a show like that as an actor is tough, but having to write it mm. is probably more difficult. Yeah. I, I, I actually think it's very, very similar. The same skill set. I think you have to work very quickly. You have to make choices that you feel confident in and own that choice. Uh, I, I, I honestly believe that they're basically on par with how difficult they are. Um, and that really great writers and actors have come out of there. I think, it's a trap that if you stay too long, and right. I remember looking around after about four years going, I better get out of here because <laughs> there I'm in a room with a lot of people who are chain smoking and saying, I'm going to get out and write a movie. And you're like, yeah, you've been here for 30 years. So I don't think that's happening. Well, that's a great segue into how you got started in this business. Now we've touched on as the world turns in terms of your writing. Um, but so what happened after that? So you left the soap and and then what? I actually left the industry. I oh. moved to San Francisco and kind of restarted my life. I was pretty disillusioned. Soap opera was not why I went to film school. USC uh, film school. Yes. It was not my dream. It was a great training program, but I did not realize it was a great training program at the time. And I rebooted and did a whole lot of other things. Drove a truck, put up drywall, worked at a lab doing uh, research. And then ultimately my cousin, who was like my older sister, she was a writer and she called me up and said, what the hell are you doing? You're a writer. Uh, she's the reason I became a writer and mm. convinced me to become a writer again. And so I moved back down to LA and I really approached, uh, getting into the industry in a different way. I didn't really know anyone. I didn't have any um, insight. We had done this movie. Or it, it 
we had a small theatrical release, but it it didn't really put me on the map. It taught me a lot of skills, but it didn't put me on the map. Mm. Uh, so I I worked every different department. I said I want to know every department how they function because I knew that being a TV writer meant you're also a producer. And I did that for four years and finally, and just kept writing scripts, just kept, it's the same as when you just keep auditioning and you, and, and you, and going to class, like you just keep writing scripts. I would rent entire seasons of shows and watch them and look how prime time was different from daytime and studied them and then worked every department on a crew. I worked grip and camera and sound and electrical, uh, painted sets, bought wardrobe, drove trucks, uh, literally did everything so that I would know every aspect of doing a TV show. What do you feel you did right? And what do you feel you did wrong when you were back then? Uh, I think what I did wrong was I had, I still had ego. Uh, I think working the different program, different um, divisions and different jobs within it um, made me a little more humble, mm. but I still had that angry, like I, why isn't anyone giving me a shot? And I think because I also had a sense of desperation and a sense of like the more that I wanted it, the less people wanted to give it to me. And I think that's yeah. the same. I think it's the same with acting. Like when I when when I've been in a room when actors have been auditioning for me, the more desperate they come across, the more worried I am about what they'll be like on set. Uh, well, there it is. So we talk about this a lot. We talk about like you can't walk into the audition room and say, "Here, hold my baggage for me." Like, here's right. my emotional baggage. Hold this while I do my audition for a few minutes. And when you come in with that sense of desperation or all your emotional baggage, it's very difficult. So it's great to get confirmation from that on from someone else on the other side of the table that that's, that's in fact true. Yes. It is I a think... fine line. Don't you feel that, like, between caring and not caring? Like, mm. if an actor comes in and, and you feel that they don't even care... Is that it can be? Yes. Is there two the, sides? It's a double right. Sword. Sometimes that's attractive. That's right. That's like yeah, well, it is attractive, right. but at the same time, it, maybe it's not. You Sometimes know, like, it's not. It's blasé or comes off as arrogant. I think there's a different. I think there's a difference between blasé and arrogant and confident. And whether I, you know, I think the confidence feels good. I think the confidence is what I'm looking for when I'm auditioning someone, especially in person. Uh, because you want someone to be able to walk in, especially if you're a guest star or a co-star or an under five, you just want them to walk in, do what they're going to do, hit it, and then not have to worry about them mm -hmm. or babysit them on set because mm -hmm. there's so many other things that you have to deal with. And I think when I finally settled into becoming an editor, and I was an editor for about three years, and I was making a very good living as an editor uh, for ABC doing all of their big promos and launching shows. And I had just a steady job and was making good money. And I, for the first time in my life, or since soap opera, I hadn't been worried about paying my bills. When I would then still go in to meet with various shows, I just was a lot more calm. And so then the, then the conversations we would have either about the show or about my past or about my writing was just a lot more uh, casual and relaxing and what I started noticing was even when I didn't get the job, those showrunners would say, oh, you should meet with this person. Or they, they they wanted to share you with other people. And that you got into the network or into the stream of um, of showrunners who are looking for a certain type of person. And once you crack that, uh, you, you, you're, you're kind of in the game as long as you don't blow it. Yeah. And and um, one of the things, too, we talk about sometimes is the importance of mentorship, the importance of having someone who's done what you want to do, someone to ask questions of, someone who's been around the block. And I know, I know, I, I firmly know that Waylon Green um, was someone who, who uh, meant a lot to you, especially when you were back in that part of your career of sort of getting back into the business, starting out. Can you tell us a little bit about that, either that relationship or, or what work you did and how Waylon helped you? Of course, yeah. And, and for um, our listeners who don't know, maybe just who Wayland is. So. Sure. I mean, I've been lucky. I've had three. I, I'm looking in my apartment right now, and I have three posters on the wall of three various mentors that I've of their uh, you know movies that they've had. Waylon Green is someone particularly special to me. He he wrote the Wild Bunch, uh, wrote movie War Games, uh, was on you know first seasons of ER, Hill Street Blues, Hill Street NYPD Blues. Blue. Right. right. Um, you know, he's just an icon. Uh, and 
I was very, very lucky to get in front of him for him to read my stuff. It took him a year to read my stuff, um, which you have to be prepared for um, because people are busy and I do the same. I try not to do that, but it, sometimes it falls through the cracks. And he finally called me up one day and he said, I read your script. Why don't you come into Law & Order and pitch some ideas? I did. He immediately bought one of them. And then I was staffed. He, he immediately changed my life. And I remember saying to him um, at one point, you know, I, I, I'm stunned at how quickly it happened. He says, well, I'm, and then I, I'd run into the fact that at that point I was 37. And uh, this industry, it doesn't really want people to start at 37, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> and he said, well, I'm actually look for people like that because they've lived other lives other than oh. just come out of film school and immediately go into writing. Right. And he, he has, he was always an advocate. We did one season and then the show, uh, it was one of those, it, we got pick, picked up for three more seasons. And then the next day, Dick Wolf and then NBC got in a fight and then it was canceled. Oh, so, Dick. uh, so it was one of those things where I thought, Oh, that was my big chance. And now it's gone. But Whalen, was very adamant that he was going to help me find other jobs. Well, that's great. And, and, and then, you know, um, I want to, I think Chris and I want to get into a little bit about, about actors and how you see actors and what they mean to you. And, you know, you'd normally, we would say, we would ask an actor, like, what does it mean to you to be a working actor? Right. Based mm -hmm. on the, like, that's what, that's what we're all about. And so we, but we want to get into that in a minute with you, but, some of the other shows after that that you worked on were uh, Rizzoli and Isles, Revenge, Supergirl, Pure Genius, Star Trek, um, and now Riverdale, right? And so you clearly, these are shows everybody knows. Everyone who's listening is like, uh-huh. Um, most of them. <laughs> and, well, not pure, them. Not pure maybe genius. not Pure Genius. That's right. <laughs> yes. Although, although great idea, Pure Genius, yeah. but uh, yeah. short-lived, right? Short, most, yes. Yeah, most of them everyone knows. Um, and, uh, I always love that you're self deprecating humor. Yes. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you've had a chance to work, uh, be on sets with a lot of actors. You've seen a lot of actors behave a certain way. You've seen a lot of actors, um, uh, prepare or not prepare. You know, we, we're trying not to preach here and say to actors like, well, you have to always be prepared. But I think there are people listening that are wondering like, well, what what do writers and showrunners look for mm. from your side of the table? You know, if actors come in the room or there's an actor that you want to get on the show, just anything that comes to mind about that, about what what really works for you, what you're really looking for. If you have an actor in mind, any part of that process? Uh, sure. I mean, a lot of things come to mind. I, I will tell just a very what I think is a very sweet story about an actor who had a ton of confidence. Um, Luke Perry, who I did not work with on Riverdale, but I knew him before Riverdale. Um, uh, Cause I joined right after, unfortunately Luke um, passed mm. very, very shockingly and unexpectedly. Yeah. Um, but I wrote a role for him for revenge. And I really, really wanted to work with him. And I wrote the script, I sent it to him. He came in we and we became friends, but about after two meetings, he said, you know, I think I'm not right for this. I think, <laughs> Uh, I think you just want to work with Luke Perry. He says, I get it. I used to be Luke Perry, but uh, I, I, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm right for this. I think, I think I, I will hurt your script. And I've never had that happen before or since, but that to me, I just, I just wanted to share that because it was someone who was so self-aware and so someone who was so, um, um, he he valued the writer and valued the words and that he did not story. want to hurt a script right. wanted to in the story. the story. And right. it was very, it was very, very, very sweet and very self-aware and very, very, a very smart man. He was a very, very smart man, a very smart actor. I, I, I will say that I, I, yes, I look for confidence and, and yes, I want people to be prepared. I, I, I'm stunned at how often people are not off book. Uh, that, that really, bothers me <laughs> mm. um, because it you're not then comfortable enough with the material to um, maybe push it in a different direction than your first read is. Mm. Uh, 
uh, or or to know what the different layers of a scene may be. So that becomes frustrating. I also get frustrated when someone says, well, I wouldn't say that. I said, well, I know you wouldn't say that. I, I've had an argument with someone who was a devout Christian who was supposed to be playing a very logical person who does not believe in fate or destiny. And this person said, well, but I do believe in that. I said, well, that doesn't matter. <laughs> and this actor wouldn't say the line, even though it had, you know, Mm. gone through this process and was very very important to not only the scene but the entire right. season it was, it was speaking it was the point where the entire season was coming to a climax and would and refused to say this because of their religious belief and I, there's a part of me that goes then why are you acting <laughs> or only do those types of movies right like, why well, take on well, the that, persona of someone else right right that was the point that they weren't getting the job you mean well, I I wish they were already got they the already job. Had it. Oh. They already had no, the job. No, yes. Well, I had a, a question, which is how how often does your because being a writer, you know, you have this your imagination is is firing, and you have this vision of who these people are, and how often does an actor change that vision? Oh, that's have, a great question. Yeah. Well, I'm actually really happy you asked that because it was something that I wanted to talk about before and then I got diverted into my my verbal stream of conscience there. But yeah, I I think that's one of the things that I love most about working with actors is how they surprise me and how they elevate the work beyond what's written on the page and how they think their job is is to look at that role, to look at those lines, to look at the actions in the scene and make sense of them and justify them and make them live. And they're going to spend more time on that than I am because I also have to write all these other scenes and I got to produce the episode and all that. So that when you come to set and they do something that surprises you or says it in a way that is quite different than what you thought, that to me is wonderful. That's why also I'm on set. I'm, I'm less of a word specific freak about some of the lines uh, because as long as the intent uh, is there behind the line i don't need them to be line perfect mm. but the only way you get like that is when you really really know the scene and you can take the scene apart and you can put it back together and so i love when an actor comes in and totally surprises me it it, it happened on riverdale i i created a role that has become a recurring character that is uh replaced luke basically playing yeah. luke's um brother and i wrote the role for a very very good friend of mine he's talked about this in, in the interview so i i i, I don't, michael truco i i truco, yeah. we we did revenge we, we did revenge together he's a great guy base you did you yeah, did a show know, uh, know, you did yeah. uh, the exes with him yep, yep. uh and he's a great actor wrote it for great him great actor he nailed the audition just nailed it like because i wrote like i every he was like no one's ever written scenes like this for me where it's just specifically for me and then I just had, you know, I have to do my due diligence and watch the other scene, the other actors. And this guy, Ryan Robbins, I'm watching it going like, oh, shit. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, and I had and I called, I had to call up Truco and go, there's this guy, Ryan Robbins. He goes, I know, Ryan. He's a good friend of mine. He was on Battlestar with me. Yeah, uh -huh. you're going to love him. He's perfect. And I was like, oh, and Ryan completely changed how I saw the role and made mm. the role so much better than what I had in mind. I love when an actor does that. That's. I'm known in the writers, every writer's room as the actor whisperer oh. because I get along with actors and I don't mind getting something on its feet. And mm. and it's it's great when you get to a set and the actor can be there and you can cut like two or three lines here or there because they're doing it with a look. The set's also doing some work. The camera is also doing some of the work. So you don't have, so you always overwrite and then you want to be able to pull it back mm. uh, on set. And an actor, a good actor who understands the scene, that's that's the best. That's, mm. that's yeah. the, then they're, they're bringing everything, all of their knowledge and all of their skill and all their artistry in a way, in the same way that a, when a wardrobe person walks in and says, this is the outfit, you're like, oh, great. Well, we can yeah, cut two the of these one. lines because that's, that's doing some of the heavy lifting yeah. in the scene as well. And, and you know, you just confirmed um, w what we've talked about, which is, uh, and we've sometimes said it in relation to casting directors, but it's clearly also true about directors and about writers and showrunners, which is 
the people on the other side of the table of the actors are rooting for them to be the answer to the problem. They want, you know, when you, when you talk about that, even if you have a, a something in mind, you want an actor to come in and do something that uh, makes you say, that's our, that's our person, that's our actor, that's our character, that's what we want. And you're rooting it for happened, them. It happened with Beige. <laughs> ah. When he walked in that door, we had someone completely different in mind. We had been pursuing another actor. Uh, the tone of that it wasn't Truco, was it? No, no, okay. no. But uh, it was, you know, it was someone who was on a popular TV show. They seemed right. to be interested. Right. Uh, Beige came in, and he did this thing with a chicken bone, uh, sitting there holding it up, talking about this chicken bone, which was the scene. And my brother and Laura Corin, who's the casting director, and I were sitting at the table, and we just looked at each other out of the side of our eyes to tell each other. Don't get too excited, but this is the guy. <laughs> it is not what we thought, ah, but this is the guy. And the universe, that is what we know yes. about it could fill a thimble. Exactly. That's right. That's I still it. remember the uh, monologue from that movie. That's right. Incredible. So it's I, it's a great feeling, right? When they it's walk a great out feel. Yeah. and you and you realize we don't have to do this anymore. Yeah. And we found the guy. When, yeah. And and everybody's on board. And yeah. you're not fighting over it. And Ted said Ted said something very important too, which is that as actors, sometimes we think I'm not right for this, right? Or I'll never get this or they'll never cast me. And in fact, if we were to go in and just be us and t with our own unique take on it, that might very well be what makes the writer, the showrunner, the director, the producer say, oh, holy shit, I never thought of it that way. You've just changed my perception of the whole thing. And that goes, and, and and you just nailed something, David, and I will say that it, it drives me crazy about a lot of TV actors now, especially young TV actors, is that they will stop the scene themselves and go back to, like, oh, no, let me take that back. And you're like, no, 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 you don't know what I'm seeing. So the fact that you don't, that you're, that you think you either made a mistake or that line reading was wrong, don't. No one's asking you to call cut. That's not your job. That's right. We will, we will, the director and I will look at each other or say, no, no, let's, this is, we're, let's roll right. it back. You but may have you just interrupted know, something really interesting. That's right. That we That's weren't right. expecting. That's right. Or, or I, I one time had that, I had had a day on a set where I was just struggling to get through this whole scene and I wanted to go back to the beginning and I came home i went to my dad's house and sydney pollock was there and i was complaining to Sidney. Oh, and he says to me chris the director already knows he's not on you at that point he's over here on this guy he's back over here he understands when he's doing a master that where he's gonna be you don't have to nail that thing man you just need to do you know get through it and mm. he's gonna tell you mm. it's just Sydney it's Paul. incredible like as you're as you're learning i mean i think that like everybody should do edit should edit and direct and then have an understanding yeah. of like w w when to keep your mouth shut and just oh, to keep going i had that experience on a show where one, an actress i was working with and it and it was a sitcom right so it's not like it's not it's not rocket science and this actress who was not really an actress she was a dancer by trade and she had just started acting and she kept saying okay so in this in the in the scene where the two of you walk in and you're having the conversation at the kitchen island like i'm back here and i'd, I'd really like to be doing something and the director said sure i see there's a dish towel there why don't you grab the dish towel and you're wiping the counters right and that didn't work and then she's like well what if i what if i have you know laundry that i'm folding okay and then it was like what if there's vegetables that i'm chopping Right. And the vegetables got really loud. And it finally, the director couldn't take it anymore. He was a very seasoned director. And finally, he just said to her, look, I'm not on you. There's four cameras. None of them see you right now. The scenes about these two other people, you, you could chop the fucking vegetables. Just do it silently because I don't even see you. Can we please move on? Which is very interesting. So your 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 idea, Chris, about like if people have edited a little bit or if they watch carefully when they watch film and TV and, and get an understanding of editing and directing, that might that might sink in. That's that's an interesting point. Yeah. Well, here, here's just build on that. It's not about 
everything being perfect and looking perfect, it's about capturing a real moment in certain types of things. If you're doing, right. you know, revenge, right. they're much more interested in right. like the hairdos right. and the dresses and all that. Fair enough, but, fair enough. But, and and I, one thing also I want to point out just to actors, which is I remember when my wife got one of her first television pilots, the the character was described as a short, stocky blonde. And my wife is none of those things. She's a tall, lanky, almost six foot brunette. And she went in and nailed that character and they were shooting in London and she knew that. And on the way out the door, they said, thank you very much. And she said, thanks, see you in London and closed the door. <laughs> and they were like, oh, holy shit. Like we have to rewrite the whole character. And she played the best friend and it was, that was it. She was Bellamy Young's yeah. best friend. And that was one of her first pilots and great lesson to actors that you don't know how the writers and the director and the producers see you go in, do your thing, let them do their jobs. And, and also we're there to protect you or the good ones are. I mean, obviously there are, but, but I've gotten into an argument with an actor who wasn't very good, but thought he was. And, <laughs> I, and I like where this is going. At one point, and he, in, you know, we were shooting him at this bar and I said, Hey, could you just lean back in your chair a little bit? He goes, no, it doesn't feel right. Like I, I, I only, I, I'm, I'm the type of actor where I can only do something that feels right. That doesn't feel right. So, well, you look like an idiot. I'm trying to actually, if you move back, it looks a lot more natural. You're not on stage. It doesn't matter what's going on there. It matters what's happening here in this frame that I'm looking at because mm. that's your stage. Mm. It's not anything else that's happening here. Where the camera is placed, where you're placed in relationship to the camera, that's what matters. So trust us when we're saying, you look dumb. I don't want you to look dumb <laughs> right. because then I right. get in then trouble. Then I look dumb, right, right. It, it's not stage. It's not theater. It's not, it, it, it is you're making a TV show and it's really what you see between, you know, in that frame that matters mm -hmm. and you can't see it. We can't. So we're here to help you. And that's why don't call cut on yourself. Don't stop in the middle of a scene. Trust us. We will stop you. We'll stop you. We really will. Cause every minute, but all I think as a producer as a writer, I just want to shoot a scene all day long. As a producer, I'm just going, how long can we get out? Time is when, money. How long Time is, is money. We, gotta, is we money. gotta get out of this scene. We gotta get out of this scene. I've been stopped a number of times. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's enough. That's, that's enough, that's enough I've heard that okay. too. Um, I was gonna say, um, could you share with us a um, like a, a positive experience that you had with either an actor or another producer or a director? Um, something that maybe changed changed you in some way? I, I will say this. I've had tremendous experiences um, with actors uh, I, I, that have changed my life. I, I, I've been so... Michelle Yeoh and I have become extremely, extremely close friends um, and have been now for five or six years. Uh, I remember in... A very big episode that I wrote, which was the climax of that season, we were going to shoot a very emotional scene. That day, her a very close friend of hers died. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, we probably should um, call it or reschedule. And she said that she wanted to use that pain uh, in this scene. And it was extraordinary. She was she was exceptional and i was very i was stunned at how she fought through some personal emotions how she was able to tap into that to give back to the show in a way because she was very committed to the show and wanted it to work we were still shooting and we hadn't aired yet and there was a lot of pressure on the show and i was very very moved by her commitment um to to the artistry, to the character, to the words. Uh, I think that was a moment that bonded us very, very tightly. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm, I'm, I felt that way with Henry Tierney a lot on Revenge. He's become one of my favorite um, people on the planet. We go camping together. Um, uh, we, he said something to me that was really interesting. 
he didn't, I, I, cause I said, oh, I can't wait to see this episode that's coming up. You're really great in it. He says, oh, I don't watch the episodes. I said, you don't? And he says, no, I, I don't because I, I try to make something real here with you and with the other actors and then how it gets edited and repackaged by the showrunners and the studios and the network. I'm really not all that interested, but when I walk, when I walk off this set feeling we, we mined something, we uncovered something, we made something, even in a show as silly and absurd as revenge, which we did, that was special. And that to me really reminded me, I don't care what show I'm doing. Whatever show I'm on, (laughs) we're going to find something in this day, if everyone is committed to that, that is real and authentic and beautiful. And I've had that on crazy shows like Star Trek and Riverdale with wizards and time travel and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't matter. It's we find something real and beautiful. If everyone's committed to that, that's a really, really special thing. And that reminds you that, oh, we're doing something cool. It's the magic of of the movie business. And, it is. Uh, that's the that's magic. The magic. Yep. It's all coming together. That's with it a, right there. With the same purpose. Um, it just it made me think that um, as a as a writer, how connected you can become to these actors that are playing these characters that you've created in your mind, you know, and and they like they come alive, and you have to have a almost a, a love affair with these characters in some yeah. way. You love these characters when they're on the page, and then you love them even more, and then they're they've come to life, you know. So I can see where that connection can be extremely strong with, with a writer and, and someone that plays a part um, that maybe even surpasses your expectations in some way. Um, mm. Well, let's, yeah, let's, I think, yeah, go ahead, Ted. I, I was going to say is that I, I also think it's important for a writer on set to create a safe environment for the actors to take risks. So for that very reason, so that if you recognize that what they're doing is not just to be a mouthpiece for what you wrote, but to actually elevate what you wrote and to uncover layers that you may not have even known were there, you need to create a safe space where they're comfortable with doing that and that you need to let them know when they do well. So I'm very enthusiastic. Michelle will always say, did, she'll say to the director, did Ted do his little dance at the monitors <laughs> while I was doing the scene? He goes, yes. And then if I if I haven't done my dance, she says, we have to do it again because he didn't do the dance. And that's oh, when she it knows. Goes, it goes back to the first thing you said, which when we asked you the question of like what you did possibly yeah. wrong, the first thing you said is I, I, I my ego was still ego involved. Got in the way. That's and right. if you, yeah, your ego gets in the way. And to allow an actor to do this, you have to really let go of your ego and, yeah. and, uh, and just leave it at the door when you walk into work. Yeah. Well, let's, so let's segue from all this magic and positivity uh, to a question we usually ask actors, which is your worst audition story ever. And I guess with you as a writer and a producer, showrunner, I, I guess we're wondering maybe what the equivalent of that is. It could be your worst pitch ever at a network. It could be it could be an experience with an actor. That would that'd help our listeners know what not to do. But um, something that comes to mind, I see you thinking furiously. There's practically smoke coming out of your ear pods. What, well, what there's... Is it? Is it? I, I mean, there were there, there's two things that jump to mind. One is uh, many years ago, uh, when I was trying to get out of soap opera, uh, I had written... Uh, a, a movie script, which was this sexy thriller. And I had these pretty bad agents at the time and said, we got someone, they're so excited to meet with you. And I walk in and all the posters are like free Willy. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and the great panda, like the great panda adventure. And just like, I'm looking around like, okay. And so I start pitching this story and they just go like why are you here (laughs) and i said well my agent set this up and they're like no we do like animal movies i went yeah (laughs) all right it's family (laughs) it's not a family Um, show i'm glad Uh, i flew from new york to la for this meeting thanks this is great that uh so that was a little that that was one of those where you're like oof Oof. when i was trying to break in to primetime um years later and at this point i was probably 35 or something because i while i was editing i was still trying to to get into being a writer 
And um, I w- even on my first year at Law and Order, that year at Law and Order, I did Law and Order in the mornings and I would do editing at night because I just didn't trust that it was going to work out. Um, but while I was trying to get in, you know, people would read my stuff. They say, oh, this is really great. And then they would find out how old I was for, to be a staff writer. And they were like, yeah, not interested. And I remember like, oh, I got I got this interview for Breakout Kings. I'm like, what is Breakout Kings? I was like, didn't matter. I watched like, all, got all the DVDs, spent all night watching, preparing on the drive. My manager calls me and goes, yeah, they decided to go a different way. And I remember pulling over and I was crying in my car on Santa Monica Boulevard, just bawling, thinking 12 hours ago, I didn't even know what Breakout Kings was. And now I am in a car <laughs> bawling my eyes out because I didn't even get a meeting. It's so important. Uh, and and I was like, what is up with this industry? What am I yeah. doing? How long those, am I going to keep doing this? Those are this great is, stories. This is what we do as actors, right? Yeah, you get that's script, right. Like the night before, instantly then, invested. That's right. And you're like at a bar drinking, like you know, the next day because your agent said it's not going any further. Right. That's right. right. That's right. Yeah. I really wanted that one. That's right. And you know, you guys. I mean, I feel. I think actors. I I, I really I really respect what actors do because they have to when they work on an audition. And I've worked with so many of my actor friends on their auditions. Those, you know, you're putting 10, 12 hours sometimes, like preparing for something, thinking about learning the lines, tearing apart lines. How how do I say, would you like coffee with that? And that's different from everyone else. You know, like that's, that's, you spend all this time doing it and you never know if someone actually watching or are they just looking at their phone while the tape is playing? You know, it, it's, it's uh, very frustrating and, we've talked and about that. it'd be yeah. soul crushing. Yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. Um, uh, So, I, I, you know, we usually end on, um, on when we talk to actors, uh, your best piece of advice and, um, knowing that there's, there's actors listening and I'm sure other writers and, and what we affectionately call civilians, but knowing there's other actors listening, um, you know, you, you've said some really wonderful things. I mean, you, you know, just your sentiment about the thing you love most about actors when they elevate the script the way you could never have imagined or, you know, that you learn more from your failures than your successes. There's, there's some, there's some deep wisdom here and we, we love that. Um, if you had to sum up something you'd offer actors from your side of the table, best piece of advice. I would say do as much prep as you can. I feel that there is this, kind of wave of younger actors especially that think like i'll just wing it you know i'll find it in the moment or they think that it's not important enough and they won't they won't put in any effort into it because it's beneath them and i don't believe anything is beneath you uh i mean you know with exception i i i would never want to do you know porn (laughs) but uh you know or some like really gross uh literally beneath you yeah yes yes, but But I, I, I think do the homework, make it be, make it be part of you only by really knowing the scene and the character and the script and the whole script. Don't just read your scenes, read the whole script, because what your character is doing in this scene influences scenes that they're not in. I've had that argument with yeah. people. So well, I don't know what you're talking about. I, it's, no, it's in this other scene. Oh, am I in that scene? No. Well, then I didn't read it. Well, then why are we having this discussion? Mm, like, right. Do the homework. Read. All we're asking is read the script, learn your lines, think about what those lines mean. Then you get, have the option to play with it. You respect the craft. You respect the director. You respect the writer. You respect all of the other artists that are around you, actors and, and the crew that are around you that don't get to wing it, they all have to do their job at 100%. So do your job at 100%. If you do, people talk about it and remember it. If you don't, people talk, talk about, about it, it and remember, remember it. it. Yeah, that's and, right. And so more, I, people, I really, more people talk about it if you don't, by the way. I, I think that's true. Although I, I, I will say that at a certain level, there there are people that like I, I go out of my way to say, and other writer friends of mine will say, this guy, this woman, the, oh my God, you want them on every show you've ever done. And that's, yeah. a, a, and yeah, I that's think- That's true, that's true. It's not just the squeaky wheel that gets all the attention. And I and I, I really do think 
the what I wish people would do more and what I'm grateful for when they do is that they do the homework, mm. that they're off book, that they've thought about the character, that they know the script from top to bottom, and they're ready to come to set to play. Amen. Thank, Amen. thank you, Ted. That's, that's amazing advice. Yeah. Um, and, and what it makes me think about is caring about the audition and the, the job being almost secondary. Because I think what happens is, um, as an actor, you get let down so many times yeah. that you, it's difficult to put that much energy into something. And somehow, if you don't put the energy in, it, maybe you won't be so hurt, you know. But at the end of the day, if you really care about the audition process and that's your work, and the others, the job is just icing on the cake, then then you will care enough to be prepared. And there's nothing worse mm -hmm. as an actor than knowing you're not prepared oh. and walking in and you know yeah. and saying, "Well, my agent told me to be here," you know. You know, oh, yeah. I'm here. Here I am. You know, you wanted to meet me, you Not know, ready like, to go. A, like my ego just like yeah. walked in before me, you know, and um, yeah. And Ted, I think uh, and, bury and, that. Yeah, that's right. We Let's get rid of that. Yeah. And Ted, I think you're right, too, that, you know, I was saying, well, you know, more people talk about it when you're not prepared or you're not good. Or, you know, and. You know, I, th I don't know about more people. I, you make a good point, which is I think a good reputation in this business goes a long way. And, you know, uh, I've always prided myself on being very well prepared um, for auditions, being very well prepared when I show up on set. And um, I think I've gotten a couple jobs because of that, because somebody drops out and they need someone last minute who they know will show up prepared, even if it's last minute and will be able to memorize the lines and take direction, make choices and and do the work and not, you know, hopefully not try to make a meal of it. And I, I think I've actually gotten some jobs because I hope uh, uh, I have a, I've cultivated a reputation as being an actor who shows up and is prepared and ready to go. And, um, you know, I I know that I, I think that goes a long way. And I uh, I, um, I just appreciate that y hearing you you talk about that. And I, I and you also reminded me, too, and what you said, Chris, Reminds me too, you know, like I have two auditions I have to do in the next couple of days. One of them I'm really excited about and one of them I'm not. And the one I'm not excited about is because I don't love the idea of the movie. I don't, I, I've started to read the script. I'm halfway through and I don't love it. The other one I really like. And I like it because it's a character I've played before. I know I can nail it. I probably don't have to prepare all that much. And you guys have now got me thinking about it. And I'm like, wait a minute. Maybe I need to love the audition process more. And, you know, maybe I need to go look at that character that I'm not so excited about and find something to be excited about and, and give that audition just as much as attention as the other one. And if I'm not going to do that, honestly, I should pass. I should just tell my agent, like, hey, uh, I, th this is great. I'm going to pass on this. I'm going to focus on the other thing. Because of, or bring uh, a chicken bun. Or bring a chicken bun, which clearly worked clearly. on Ted <laughs> Sullivan. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think I think that's an excellent point. And there have been times where I've been in Video Village and turned to the director and been like, why is she here? Why is she doing this? If she doesn't want to be here, like, go. someone else would have killed for this role and someone else would be killing it right now. Like, you are, you're not only just making our lives miserable here, you're robbing someone who wants this job and will do this job and appreciate this job. I knew. Pure Genius was going to get canceled after the first episode, and it was. I did the 10th episode. I I was shooting my episode on the day we were canceled. Oh. And I still, that was my first day of on set. And I told everyone, guys, we are here to do a show. And I cared about that script. It was, I wrote very personal stuff in it. I made connections with those actors that I still have today because I was like, we are going to get through this and we're going to make yep. something. We're, and we made a good episode. That's it. If it was, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing well. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Amen. 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 Even in, even if it's daytime. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, whatever it is as actors, we, we turn our nose up sometimes. Um, and it, 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 we would do well. Those of us who've been doing this a little while would do well to remember when we first started out, we wouldn't toes, turn our nose up at anything. Right. Any chance to set foot on the stage 
any set, any chance to be on a set and uh, have a camera pointed in our direction. And uh, that's that's worth remembering for sure. So thank you. For we all, reminding we used to all do it for free. Yeah. I mean, I think fair. about like how many scripts and short films and all that I, I spent money to make. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, the very fact that we get paid to do this from time to time is miraculous to me. It, it's, it sure is. It sure well, thank is. You well, for sharing your wisdom. Yes, with us. thank you. And we, we know you get really getting paid to write. That. So, so yeah, go 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 get paid to write uh, Revenge and uh, Riverdale. Sorry, Riverdale and uh, a lot of shows that start with R. Um, yes. And uh, thank you for joining us. And yes, Chris hit it on the head. Thank you for sharing all that wisdom. That was just a lot of wisdom and. Uh, a very different perspective than we've had on the show so far and very much appreciated. Awesome. Well, you guys were great. This was a lot of fun. Uh, I definitely will not listen because I'll have to just, unless you can send me just your part so I don't have to listen to my own voice. Right. That would be fine. We'll, we'll, we'll blank I'll, you out. Yes. Yes. We can do I'll, that, I'll right, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> we can do that. Thank you, Ted. I appreciate it, really. Awesome. Yep. Thanks, guys. Good stuff. Ted Sullivan, writer, producer, go EP on Riverdale. Uh, I'm very excited to see what my friend Ted is going to be doing next. And for all the actors out there, um, some great advice. Great advice. And tune in next week. Who knows who we're talking to? Big surprise.